Hello once again my ghouls and goblins and welcome back into the fog. I've got something for you today. I'm Taylor, your casual crypt keeper, and let's take a listen. Ed and Lorraine Warren are always a popular subject for us around here on Top 5 Scary. We love them. The two made an impressive career out of demonology, chasing spirits all across the globe and recording it for future generations thanks to their son-in-law, Tony Sparrow. New footage is coming out all of the time and we got five hot ones for you today. This is the Top 5 Ed and Lorraine Lost Footage that just got uncovered part two. Let me know down below in the comments which of these cases you'd like to hear way more about. There's lots and lots of Ed and Lorraine stuff out there. Number five, Annabelle. Well, it wouldn't quite be a video about the Warrens without Annabelle. Do you ever wonder, did they ever thank her for all the good publicity she gave them over the years? Now, by now, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the tale of Annabelle, the haunted doll that Ed and Lorraine kept captive, and probably the most famous case the two of them were involved in. They say that the Amityville Horror was their most famous case, but they made three spin-off movies just about Annabelle, so she's pretty big shakes. It was given to a nursing student as a gift from her mother, and within days it turned bad. Notes would appear around the house, scrawled in blood, that read out terrifying messages like, help me. It allegedly lunged at the girl's boyfriend one night, grabbing him by the neck. And after that, Ed and Lorraine were called in. I mean, as soon as a toy in your apartment starts trying to choke you out, yeah, definitely get some outside help. They called in to help exercise the demon inside Annabelle. Now, in the end, they kept her locked up tight, surrounded by rosaries and holy water to ensure the demon inside can't harm anyone anymore. Now, while the stories inspired by Annabelle have gone on to big, great things, and the fictional Annabelle has enjoyed quite the career as a movie star, the real Annabelle is still locked away to keep that evil dormant. In this recently released footage, we're treated to some up-close and personal glamour shots of Annabelle in the flesh, or, uh, stuffing, maybe? Locked tight behind her cage. And this footage comes to us from Tony Spera, the son-in-law of Ed and Lorraine, who's taken it upon himself to maintain their legacy on his YouTube channel. If you're a big Ed and Lorraine fan, go check it out, because there's hours and hours of stuff to work through. He takes us on a brief tour of the museum, but gets up close and personal with Annabelle herself. Even through a YouTube screen, you can almost feel some evil energy radiating off this doll. Now, sadly, the Warren's Museum of the Occult is currently closed, so you can't visit Annabelle right now, but they're hoping to reopen it one day soon, so Annabelle can get back to scaring her fans in person like she always has. She makes convention appearances, did you know that? She just recently was at the Warrens Paracon, the convention dedicated to supernatural hunters of the unknown. I'm not sure if I personally would take a selfie with Annabelle, I wouldn't want to ruin her photo like that, unless I could guarantee she'd look really good. I don't want to offend her in any way. I, I try not to upset any cursed dolls. And if you're looking for way more stories about Ed and Lorraine Warren, true tales of terror, fake fibs of fright, ghouls, goblins, cryptids, aliens, true crime, basically everything scary under the sun and above it, Top 5 Scary is the only place to be. Stay subscribed, stay scared, and don't miss a thing. But let's keep going, because we got a whole lot more video to go through. Number 4. Under Scotland. Now the Warrens' investigations did not just take them on road trips all over the United States. Now the Warrens might have visited a case in almost every state and then some. The Warrens' journey saw them traveling all over the globe in an effort to uncover truths and combat evil wherever it was found. In this recently posted footage, we get to see a unique perspective from the Warrens, focusing on Lorraine Warren digging around underground in the secret vaults beneath Edinburgh. Under the ground is a series of large, cavernous vaults that were once used as a storage space for merchants, but when abandoned, it became home to Edinburgh's lowest and poorest who began to make it their dwellings. Probably really, really nice, what with no daylight, musty air, a, fr a thriving rodent population, and Hey, for the right price, that honestly sounds better than most apartments in Toronto. Because of this, the vaults were the perfect place to conduct a little nefarious business, if you know what I mean. You know, all sorts of nasty crimes that aren't fit to discuss on YouTube. It's believed that two of Edinburgh's most prolific criminals hid bodies here, before taking them to medical schools to sell off. So, because of its grim history, it's no surprise that people believe the vaults to be haunted, claiming they feel watched or touched when walking through them. So when supernatural weirdness happens, the Warrens are soon to follow. This this one's actually pretty cool. It's kind of like going on a ghost tour from your own home. First person making you feel like you're exploring those subterranean depths with her. The real highlight though is the guide, who's this very geriatric Scottish man who seems to know the tunnels very well. If I ever take this tour, I need to insist on my guide being an old Scottish man who I almost can't understand. That seems like the most appropriate and trustworthy way to go ghost hunting. Now they didn't find anything too much on this investigation, but while in there, Lorraine claims that she can feel something communicating with her long, long ago. 
Could it just be the spirits from long, long ago or radio feedback? Let me know in the comments. Number three, the Donovan Poltergeist. Now our next entry is going to cover the Donovan Poltergeist, an often forgotten case in the Ed and Lorraine Warren oeuvre. In this clip, moderator Tony Sparrow, he's coming up a lot in this video, mentions that Ed has told him that on a scale of one to 10 for demonic intensity, I love that you can rank demonic intensity like that. The Warrens found this case to be a 10. Now I gotta ask, if it's so intense, I wonder why it's not more well known, but maybe they're keeping it hush hush because this is gonna be the plot of Conjuring 4, so I'm giving you the spoilers right now. The Donovan Poltergeist case was in West Hartford, Connecticut, when a young girl had come into possession of a Ouija board, one of the most haunted Hasbro products ever released, alongside the game Sorry. Ed briefly talks about how people can be so dismissive of Ouija boards. Guy, I mean, imagine who would be so dismissive of Ouija boards. Don't know anybody like that. And Ed mentions that although they may seem innocent and unbecoming like a children's toy, a Ouija board is an invitation for spirits to come and disrupt. The girl in question in the Donovan case asked the Ouija board all sorts of questions and started to get answers that only a spirit could give. Ed says that the spirit needed something in return, and afterwards her house started to become rabid. Objects thrashed around, levitating, so on. Ed describes a violent interaction with a poltergeist, claiming that at one point during their investigation, he found himself literally pinned to the wall by a malevolent spirit. He describes as well the house being pelted with rocks from the sky and objects vanishing. Imagine the size of the umbrella you would need if it's raining rocks. This definitely sounds pretty extreme, all things considered. They claim that they would watch things dematerialize in front of their very own eyes, as if Mr. Scott was teleporting them away on the Star Trek transporter. Now eventually, Ed describes getting in contact with a priest to perform an exorcism on the cursed house, freeing the family from spectral torment. And stay tuned to see if that's going to be the plot for Conjuring 4. I'm, I'm almost pretty sure. Number two, the Japanese tunnels. Among the many accolades and achievement in his career, before he was a ghost hunter, Ed Warren was a veteran of the US Navy and served in the Second World War and spent a good amount of time stationed around Japan. As such, from a young age, he developed an interest in Japanese folklore and the yokai and spirits that go with it. So naturally, they had to take a trip out east to go investigate some spirits there. They took a trip to Nagoya to investigate an apartment building that allegedly was being haunted by the floating head of an ancient samurai warrior. That's uh, unnerving. I've heard of headless ghosts. I've even heard of nearly headless ghosts. But I think this is the first time I've heard of a ghost that was just a head. I think that honestly might be way scarier just seeing a head like floating around down a hallway. But that's just me. Now this wasn't the sole focus of their journeys though. They had more going on. The two of them also sought out an exploration of Japan's haunted tunnels. A tunnel where 200 people were allegedly buried alive after an avalanche during a typhoon trapped some 200 souls inside and made the tunnel their grave. Local reports would claim that the people would hear the screams of the damned late at night. So Ed and Lorraine visited it and they both said it was terrifying and claimed that walking through it was freezing, the coldest thing either of them had ever experienced. Ed said a bitter cold came over him as he reached the end. He relays as well a story of a young man who tried to challenge his fear of the supernatural and ride a motorcycle right through this tunnel but paid for it with his life and crashed. Now for what it's worth, you know I love playing skeptic around here. You know I love getting my scully on. I'm more of a scully than I am a molder. I think this might be more of an urban legend because I did do a lot of digging for this video and I could not find any confirmed stories of a mass death inside a tunnel in Japan from an avalanche, but it's possible that it could be lost to time, very ancient, maybe records get lost, but nonetheless, interesting to listen to. And number one, the Amityville interview. Now, the Warrens argued that the most famous case they ever worked on was the Amityville horror, and there's no denying that when this case happened, it gripped the American public. In 1973, Ronald DeFeo took a hunting rifle and went one by one, ending the lives of each one of his family members remorselessly while they slept. He would later go on to claim that he was being commanded to do it. He was compelled by spirits to act this way. A little bit later, a new family, the Lutzes, moved into the Amityville house aware of what had transpired, but moving forward with it anyway. It's just such a good deal on rent. You gotta take it where you can get it. In this recently released footage, we hear from Ed and Lorraine speaking in great detail about their experiences working on the infamous legendary case on their TV program Seekers of the Supernatural with the Warrens. Lorraine outlines how immediately upon walking in, she felt stepping into the house. She felt immediately wrong. She reiterates that upon entering, she felt a great unnerving presence. She says pretty much as soon as she entered the sewing room, she turned to the homeowner and said, I hope this is as close to hell as I get. That's 
raw. The sewing room allegedly is where a focus of the haunting was, where the hundreds of flies apparated, where the spectral voices were heard telling people to get out. They speak as well of how they brought a reverend with them in the investigation who felt a physical slap in his face walking in. And if you're looking for more details about the Amityville case, the uh, movie from the 70s and the movie with Ryan Reynolds both pretty good retellings of the story. Ed goes on to address allegations that the Amityville case was a hoax, saying he offered a $3,000 reward for anyone who could prove to him that it was faked. Later in life, the lawyer representing Ronald DeFeo claims that the entire haunting story was a concoction he made up with the Lutzes over a bottle of wine in an effort to get a retrial for his client and drum up a bit of book business for the Lutzes. No word if he ever ended up getting $3,000 out of Ed. So whether or not the story really happened is one thing, but I think we can all agree the folklore that has come out of it is interesting enough and is a definitive part of the greater American mythos, this classic haunted house story. And it's entertaining nonetheless. Well, that's all she wrote, my friends. Thanks so much for watching my ghouls and goblins. Creep on creeping on and hopefully I'll see you in the next one, provided I'm not cursed or anything.